Professor Heiner Stöger is a full professor of educational science at the University of Regensburg, Germany. She holds a chair for school research, school development, and evaluation. She is vice president of the International Research Association for Talent Development and Excellence. She published more than 100 articles, chapters, and books on giftedness, self-regulated learning, motivation, fine motor skills, and teacher education. She is a member of several national and international scientific boards and expert commissions in the field of giftedness research and gifted education. Heidrun Stöger has honored our Congress as a special guest, gifted education at South Germany Talent Center and others. I'm inviting Mrs. Heidrun Stöger to the stage to make her presentation. Good evening. I hope everybody can hear me. I know it's the last presentation. I hope you're not too tired and I hope I still can give you some interesting information that you might use for your work if you want. So it's a big honor for me to come back to Turkey again. I've been here several times and each time I'm happy to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, the organizers asked me to talk a little bit about the German school system and about the work we are doing in our South German Talent Center, which is located at two universities. Um, and uh, maybe as a background, I'm mainly doing research. I'm responsible for teacher education at my university. We have 6,000 students who want to become teachers in different fields uh, and areas. And, um, but what is important for me, not only to do research, but also to work closely with, with practitioners and to find out if the things that we are doing in schools is, are really effective and are really working out. And I'm not only working with gifted students, I'm also working in regular classrooms, so I will also talk a little bit about um, educating students in regular classrooms, all students at the same time, maybe at several levels, but all of them should, of course, increase in their achievements and things like that. So as I said, I'll start shortly with uh, the German school system uh, that might be interesting for you. So first of all, Germany has six, 16 federal states and each federal state has different school systems. So it's not easy to talk about the German school system. But uh, if we look at the 16 federal state, uh, states, what is common is that they either have a tracking system or they have comprehensive schools. And uh, a tracking system means uh, that we have uh, three different types of schools after primary school, the so-called Hauptschule, the Realschule and the Gymnasium. And I know Gymnasium sounds like sports, but it doesn't have anything to do with sports. Uh, it's a high achiever track of the German school system. So that's also the only track that entitles students later on to go to universities. Students who go to the low or average achiever track, and of course you can discuss about that if it's a good idea to decide after fourth grade to send students to different tracks, but uh, we do it, so uh, it's a big discussion in Germany as well. Um, the high achieving students normally go to the gymnasium, to the high achiever track. There are also possibilities later on if they um, have high achievements in the other two types of schools, they can, can also go to university, but the typical way would to be to go to the high achiever track. Uh, we had 13 years of schooling for a long time. They skipped the 13th grade in all federal states now, and just last week my federal state, Bavaria, in which I work, decided to go back to 13 years. So you see, we also try out what is best, what is not best. We do a lot of research, longitudinal research, to find out what kind of schooling might be best. When it comes to gifted education, we probably have very similar things than the US or other countries in Asia 
or also here I heard uh, some of the examples, but they are all um, in the law, so uh, people are entitled to do it. What we do not have is homeschooling. Homeschooling is not allowed in Germany. So, um, oops, my... Did you see any of my slides? Yes. <laughs> so uh, the gymnasium, some would say it's already kind of gifted education. And for a while it maybe was because only about 15% of the students went to the gymnasium in earlier times. But nowadays it's about 40 to 50% of students who go to the gymnasium. So that's why um, they started to do other things. For example, we have several schools for gifted students in the meantime, uh, and all of them are boarding schools. So that means students also live there. They have kind of school families. The teachers also live in the schools. They do extracurricular programs in the evenings during the weekends. And uh, it's a combination of acceleration, so quick quicker learning of the same curriculum and enrichment, so extra programs. Besides that, uh, we have the typical acceleration measures like early schooling. So, for example, normally students go to school with six, six years, but uh, if they pass some tests, they can already start with four or five years. They can skip grades, so they can just skip one, two, or three grades to be quicker in their schooling. And some schools also have uh, a mixed age classes, so that means they can learn in their own speed. So, for example, if they are very quick learners in mathematics, they can already do the curriculum of the third grade in first grade and things like that. We have enrichment programs like uh, competitions, extracurricular workshops, uh, student exchange programs. So I think all of you have heard about these measures. And we have mixed forms like what I just showed you, the schools where we have acceleration. So in these schools, the students do the 12 years of schooling within eight years or nine years or 10 years, depending on the speed they're choosing. And they have extra curricular programs and enrichment programs with regular um, contents of school curriculum. So I think you heard a lot about these kinds of measures, and that's why I wanted to keep that quite short. And I thought you might be more interested in the work we are doing in our South German Talent Center. And here we are really trying to combine practical work and research and to find out what really works in practice. So the Thaus German Talent Center is located at two universities. One is at the University of Nuremberg. Albert Ziegler is located there. He will give his presentation tomorrow. And the other is the University of Regensburg, where I am located as a professor. And we are, and our teams are working on various aspects. So our local activities are mainly identification and education of the gifted students, and I want to give you an idea what we are doing when it comes to identification and education, because for us it's not really a big difference if it's identification or education, not like in many other counseling centers where students are identified and then you know they're gifted and that's it, so we really combine the identification and the education. And how we do that, uh, we use a model that is called Explore. It's uh, Enter, sorry, it starts with the step Explore. And in the Explore step, normally parents call us in the counseling center and say, okay, I think I might have a gifted student or a gifted child uh, and I want to find the best education for my child. And when the parents call us, we normally send out questionnaires. It's very long questionnaires. It's about 20 pages. And we try to find out something about the development of the students and uh, their learning behavior, their social behavior, and many aspects. And if we have the idea that uh, it could be a student that 
need special uh, support from our side, we start with the explore phase. So explore means uh, we analyze various aspects within the individual. So we also, like many counseling centers, use IQ tests, learning strategy tests, motivation tests, and things like that. But uh, maybe different than other centers, we also take a very close look at the environment of the student. So we try to find out how much do the parents, uh, the friends, uh, the families value education, how well do they uh, support their children when they are learning. So we really try to get a very broad picture of the child, its emotional, social, motivational development. We also do interviews not only with the children and the parents, uh, but also with the Siblings, for example, because if the brothers and sisters are envious because one child has a special support, it might uh, be difficult. Or if the peers, uh, the friends, are not very in, much in favor of learning, that might become a problem. So we do interviews. And for the smaller children, we also do observations. So, for example, the parents bring their children to the counseling center. We look at their playing behavior. We look at their social interactions to find out how their developmental stage is and if uh, we have the impression they're, if, that they are gifted. And of course, as other counseling centers as well, we use standardized tests as well. But it's only a small aspect. Some of the parents are happy with the explore stage. So if we stop here and say, okay, we have the impression the student needs special support uh, to, to really develop uh, the talents, then they go to the transform stage. But mon some of the parents also want to have a narrow stage. So for example, they want to find out in which area is my student especially talented. So let's say, is my, uh, my child especially talented in mathematics? If uh, parents want to find out that, we do a very similar approach. So you saw Explore already took several days. <laughs> and uh, to do the narrow stage, uh, we take uh, another several days into a very similar approach as in Explore uh, and use similar measures, but only for the domain they're interested in, for example, mathematics or arts or whatever they choose. And in the next step, so I think identif uh, the explore and narrow stage, it's maybe not as broad in some counseling centers, but most counseling centers do it. And uh, as I told you, for us, it's very important to include education into the identification process. So we are of the opinion you can't stop there. What does it help if I say, okay, a student is talented, but I don't tell him or her what to do with the talents? So the next stage is the most important stage, and it sometimes takes several years. So the students uh, come to the counseling center together with their parents, siblings, peers, teachers, sometimes together with their mentors, and we identify a learning path. So that means we try to find the best support measures for each individual child. So, for example, we plan and supervise learning activities depending on the talents, on the developmental stage. Uh, that can be a special school, it can be enrichment programs, it can be mentoring. But it is very important that it is planned for several years and that it is adapted again and again uh, as long as the student develops. So after that, uh, the next two stages, uh, so you don't really have to read that. We have some literature. If you want to find out more what we are really exactly doing, I can give you uh, the chapter. If you're interested, I can send it to you just to give you an idea. The last two steps, evaluate and review, aren't really for the children so much. I mean, they are for the next children who come, but it's more for us as researchers. Evaluate here, we try to find out how good our counseling was. Uh, did the children really reach their goals? So for example, if their goal was to become a great mathematician or to skip a grade, we want to find out did that work out. And of course, that can only be done several years after the goals are reached in some cases. 
Sometimes it's also much quicker done if they just want to find out if they successfully skipped a, can skip a grade. In the review uh, stage, we try to find out if we chose uh, the most suitable learning path. So for example, it can be that we suggest to skip several grades, but later on we find out it would have been much better to send the student to a giftedness school. So these last two stages are more a quality assurance for ourselves to improve our own counseling approaches. So that's what we are doing in the counseling center that is located in the Nuremberg University. It's more the focus there. My focus is very much on teacher education because it's very important uh, to train teachers to do optimal education for uh, their students, not only, as I said, their gifted students, but all students. And uh, we are offering several teacher trainings to uh, teachers in various types of schools. What we do are professional development seminars for teachers. These seminars normally take two to three full days, so three eight-hour days. And we give different kinds of training programs. For example, uh, in each case, we show them how to implement highly effective training programs to their regular students. And one example would be to teach them learning strategies, metacognitive strategies, and always combined with learning content. So for example, we are doing training programs in mathematics, and while we are teaching mathematics, we also teach time management strategies and metacognitive strategies like goal setting and planning the learning behavior. So what do you think? Why is it important to teach learning strategies to gifted students? I, I'm not sure about Turkey, but in Germany, and I also know it about the USA because I have a cartoon for you that's English speaking, we have a lot of stereotypes about gifted students. And I think uh, the cartoon quite nicely shows our stereotypes, at least in Western countries. So I read it to you. I'm not sure if the translator can read it. What happened to you? Hobbes and I had a frank exchange of ideas. What are you doing? Homework? I wasn't sure I understood this chapter. So I reviewed my notes from the last chapter, and now I'm uh, rereading this. You do all that work? Well, now I understand it. Whoa, I thought you were smart. So that very nicely shows the stereotype many Germans, for example, have. If a student is gifted, the student doesn't really have to learn. And of course, that's right for a while. As long as they're in primary school or in regular school education, they learn very easily. They don't have to use learning strategies. They just get the best grades. But as soon as they come to another educational setting, if they go to a giftedness school, if they go to a difficult university major, they, as every other student as well, have to learn. And then it's a big problem. There's a lot of research on that gifted students fail because they never had failures before. They just don't have any experience with having to learn. And as soon as they have to learn, they have the impression they are not smart anymore. So as early as possible, we should teach learning strategies to gifted learners as well. But to do that, and that's why we combine it with, lear with learning content, we have to develop certain learning contents. Because if the learning contents are not difficult enough, it's just no use for them to use learning strategies. I mean, they're really clever. If they see I don't need a learning strategy, why should they use a learning strategy? They just can have very good grades without. So that's why we develop training programs for regular classrooms, so for all students, that have different kinds of tasks, but also very difficult tasks for very talented students, so that also talented students only can succeed if they use learning strategies. 
So they only can improve their achievements if they use learning strategies. And that's a lot of work, I can tell you. So if you're a teacher, it took us about three years for mathematics, for example, to develop the tasks. Uh, what we do, we teach uh, these training programs to teachers. We give all the learning materials to the teachers. And after that, they implement the learning programs in their regular classrooms for at least seven weeks for one subject and one learning strategy. That's the next thing. What's done very wrong in many cases in Germany is that they have kind of learning how to learn or learning how to learn uh, days or weeks. So they do it for one day or one week. But that's like if I would explain to you how to ride a bike. I can explain it very great to you. So I can have a very good explanation for you. Still, none of you will know how to ride a bike if you don't have uh, the chance to practice. The same comes true for learning strategies. So we need at least six weeks of daily training for learning strategies with uh, learning content to make sure that students really can use learning strategies properly. So that's why we normally have training programs of seven weeks daily training in regular classrooms. So some of you might sit there now and say, OK, that's a lot of work. Even if I get the material, that's really a lot of work. Do I really want to do that? And I would ask that as well if I was a teacher. So when would you say it's worth all the effort? What would you say? I would say it's only worth if there are at least as good as students with regular classroom instruction. So if I teach mathematics and learning strategies, of course I want to achieve my students at least as well as students who get regular mathematics instruction, and I also want them to have better learning behavior afterwards. So what we do, we do a lot of research and we of course, it doesn't work immediately, but we are only really happy with our training programs if we have results like that. So if we have classrooms with training programs who really improve concerning learning behavior, concerning their achievements, and so there, that's a red line, but they also have to be better than classrooms that learn the same contents but don't have the same training programs. So normally we have several hundred classrooms in the training conditions and several hundred classrooms in the uh, training, uh, in the control groups. And only if this works, we are kind of happy with our programs. <laughs> we are still not really happy. You probably wonder, okay, we are in a conference for gifted students. What about gifted students? And a big topic in Germany is because we have many special programs for gifted, but not all parents want to send their uh, children to gifted schools or to gifted tracks in the school. So we try to also have programs where we can make sure that all students profit from the training program. So what you see here, the, the, probably for you it's black, <laughs> the black line are the gifted students and the, the pink line are the average students. So we look at the achievement levels, the intelligence and things like that before the training and we look if they develop in a similar way. Of course, they are better already when we start the training, the gifted students normally. But all of them should have an increase in achievement, in motivation, and in, um, in learning behavior. And uh, because one of you is very interested in the emotional development, we just do some studies on emotion and learning strategy trainings. We also found that boredom decreases if they're doing training programs like that because many of the gifted students are bored in regular classrooms, so the boredom decreases and the joy when learning increases. So I could talk for days about that, but <laughs> I have only 15 minutes left and I try to make up for some of the time we started later. So 
Um, the last thing I want to uh, talk about are online programs, and that might be interesting for you because in about three to four years we are planning to do an international program. It would be for free for gifted students, so if you want to send Turkish students, we would be very happy to include them. Uh, it's an online program for talented students, and we started in Germany. And I just give you an idea about our German program. So why online program and what exactly are we doing? I want to give you one case study. This is Katrin. She's 12 years old. She's in grade six. And she's very interested in microbiology. So remember, she's 12. She wrote in, an, on, in a, an online forum the following text. So I read part of it because uh, some of you probably needs a translation. Hi, everybody. Check this out. A little notice paradoxical effect of penicillin G on enter <laughs> enterococcus, the eagle effect, was reported in 1948. Working with modern methods, researchers were able to show that high concentrations of, of penicillin G led to a much weaker neutralization of enterococcus than do, did concentrations that were only slightly above the minimal inhibitory concentration, and so on and so on. So you remember she's 12. So the underlying text, uh, you don't have to read all. If, if you can't read English, it's not a problem. I just read some parts. This really makes me wonder. What is the cause of this effect? And then it goes on. And then she writes, in a 2004 dissertation, probably outdated, you find the following remark about the eagle effect. And then she cites the dissertation. So you see, it's a 12-year-old girl. She's reading dissertations, which she thinks are probably outdated now. And you could say, oh, great. But then we go into her classroom. That's her curriculum. At school, she learns about the structure and appearance of flowering plants. So parts that make up a plant, how flowering plants reproduce, growth and energy storage, and so on. So you can imagine, I talked about boredom several minutes ago. Probably she will be very bored. So we thought, what could we do for students like that? And we came up with the idea to do mentoring. Actually, the government approached us, and uh, they said they want to do a German-wide project. And we thought, OK, what can we do? For example, if they live in very rural areas, children can't go to programs with mentors, because parents maybe don't have the money to bring them and things like that. So we came up with the idea of online mentoring. And what we started was a German-wide uh, online mentoring program. In the program, 800 students participate every year. And we also have 800 mentors. The mentors are doing it for free. Most of them are either scientists who have a PhD. Some of them are professors. We also have uh, people from STEM, so it's only for STEM, the mentoring program, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And uh, many of them work for uh, Max Planck Institute, BMW, Daimler, Siemens, places like that. So the 800 mentors give their time for free for one year. And what they do, they uh, counsel an individual mentor, mentee for one year via mail, chat, and forum. And after three months, two of the mentoring pairs are combined into a mentoring community, and they work on STEM projects. I will talk about that in a minute. Besides the mentoring, we also have the possibility or opportunity for our participants to do networking with all participants. So they have 1,600 participants they can uh, communicate with, they can work on projects with, for example, via chat, forum, or emails. And some of the mentors, of course, also organize uh, meetings at their institutes, like Fraunhofer Institute, Max Planck Institute, uh, Daimler, and so on. They sometimes give money to bring the students to their companies or research institutions. 
What we do, we moderate all these chats. We also offer thematical chats about some STEM topics. Uh, we also offer various kinds of STEM materials for the students online. Uh, everything is for free for the students, of course. And we also have different kinds of pro uh, programs over the year. So the first three months, the students uh, just discuss why STEM is important and that STEM plays a role in everyday life, nearly in everything. After that, uh, the mentor and mentee get some projects from us uh, and they work on small projects for several weeks. So for example, they program a website together or they do some chemical experiments, depends from which field the mentor is. And after that, so after half a year, the community is working on bigger projects and in many cases several pro communities come together and work on big projects, like one example would be how does a guidance system find the shortest route. So these are interdisciplinary projects. And at the end of the mentoring year, the mentees and mentors just think back what they learned. Uh, they can write manuscripts about their projects if they want to and um, just reflect about uh, their learning. If they want, they can also participate for more than one year, the mentees. So we have the project now for 10 years and many of our mentees are now mentors themselves. And we also do a lot of research in the project and found out that really many of our students, so it's high school students, go into university fields of STEM and uh, some of them already finished their university studies in STEM. And our dream is to broaden the project to make a worldwide project and hopefully I soon have some good news and we would of course be happy to include Turkey and many other countries as well. So thank you very much for your attention and maybe we have some time for questions now. Evet ben bu güzel sunumdan dolayı teşekkür ediyorum. Benim sorum Almanya ile ilgili bir soru olacak. Daha önceki yıllarda 6. sınıftan Real Şule'ye ve gimnazyuma yönlendirme yapılıyordu. Bildiğim kadarıyla bu çok olmadı 4. sınıftan sonra yönlendirme. 6. sınıftan sonraki yönlendirme ile 4. sınıftan sonraki yönlendirme arasında ne gibi farklılıklar oldu? Pozitif yönde 4. sınıftan sonraki yönlendirme büyük katkı sağladı mı? Ben de buna inanıyordum 4. sınıftan sonraki yönlendirmenin daha etkili, daha güzel olacağını bilmiyorum. Bu sonuç alınabildi mi Almanya'da? 4. sınıftaki yönlendirmenin daha etkili, daha iyi olduğunu düşünüyor musunuz? So I'm not absolutely sure if I got the question. It's for the translator. The question was if it's better to transfer after fourth or after sixth grade. Is that right? The mentorship. Okay. Um, so the mentorship should actually start as early as possible because uh, there are many research findings that both boys and girls lose their interest in the field of STEM when they're about 11, 12 years old. And uh, for boys it decreases but not as steeply as for girls. So especially girls lose their interest for STEM very quickly after uh, their adolescence. So it really should start as early as possible. STEM programının içindeki engineering kısmı yaratıcı düşünmenin inovasyonu oradan da girişimciliğe doğru gitmesi için bir taban oluşturur mu? Bunu gözlemleyebiliyor musunuz? Ya da sizce eğer böyle değilse engineering dediğiniz kısım öğrendiği bilgileri fonksiyona ve bir takım günlük hayat problemlerini dönüştürmesi için mi? Sisteme çok aşina olmadığım için yani kaba taslak çok derinlemesine bilmiyorum kaba taslak bildiğim kadarıyla. So um, actually, I would say you can enhance innovation, but originally the goal of the government was not to enhance innovation. It was to do something for talented students and to bring more students into the field of STEM. Because in Germany we have a big problem. We don't have enough uh, students who go into the field of STEM at university. So that was the main goal of the government. 
uh, but after 10 years, I would say it's not only working to bring and things like that. Ee, daraltma konusundan bahsettiniz. Hangi alanda daha yetenekli olduğunu öğrenmek için. Ben sınıfta bunu uygulamak için yani zenginleştirme için gruplar yaparken hangi öğrencinin hangi alanda daha yetenekli olduğunu bulmaya çalışırken e, nasıl bir yöntem kullanabilirim? Bunu açar mısınız biraz? Mesela otobiyografisini yazdırmak çocuğa. Örneğin de olduğu gibi. Sınıfta kullanmak için ya da herhangi bir alanda. So, um, so you're referring to the enter model now, right? Or just generally identification? In general. In general. Okay. So, hmm. actually, I'm not sure if you could do something like narrow in a regular classroom. So, I think we have to differentiate between counseling and teaching in regular classrooms because. Uh, in a regular classroom, I don't know how many students you have at maximum in Turkish classrooms. In Germany, it would be 32. And it's just not possible to do a narrow, a thorough, narrow stage for every student. So we have to be realistic what is doable if we don't have individual uh, support for students. So what you could do and what works quite well uh, in Germany is either if you teach together with other teachers uh, that you, for example, do some uh, group exercises for students who are uh, especially interested in one field and you give uh, different uh, difficulty levels uh, to the students in different fields. But even that is sometimes not doable if you're alone. So in many countries, two teachers are in one classroom. That helps a lot because if you want to do it in a proper way, it's really important to differentiate, to have different tasks, uh, to really discuss the tasks. Some of them have to uh, get very basic knowledge. Uh, you have to do some, give some input before they can do the tasks. Others already can work on their own. They can just read or, or uh, maybe even do some other tasks alone. Uh, so that really depends on the situation you have. But I probably, to start with, I'm not, I'm not so I would have to know more about your uh, the subject, about your school and things like that. But uh, probably you could start with one subject uh, and uh, try to develop tasks in one subject for different uh, achievement levels, if it's a regular school, not a gifted school, uh, and uh, try to broaden uh, the tasks from year to year because I think it's, it's much different if I do something like that is I have a team of 30 persons in my university all of them are only res only <laughs> researchers who develop material but they don't go to the school and teach so you have to do the daily teaching you have, and develop the material and things like that so either you use material that's already there and just adapt it to your needs in your classroom that works very well normally and then I would not have the aim to do it immediately within six weeks or half a year but really develop it step by step. I hope that helps a little bit, but we can talk more in more detail. I think I would know, need to know more about your school type, your uh, subject, and things like that. Good afternoon. Kayser Adnan Menderesko Okulu'ndan Sertan Ballı, aynı zamanda Scientings elçisi. Sistemle ilgili yaptığınız çalışmalara sanatı da eklemeyi düşünüyor musunuz? Yoksa sanatla ilgili yaptığınız sistemle ilişkilendirdiğiniz çalışmalar var mı? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we are not including it. Uh, I know uh, the field of STEAM <laughs> is becoming very popular. Uh, it's just uh, a matter of mentors and the approach we use. We would have to change the approach very much if we want to do a, wanted to do a good project that also includes arts. So at the moment, it's really only science, technology, engineering, and mathematics we are including. So I don't say it's not good to include it, but uh, it's just more doable for us. Yeah. Evet. evet. Öncelikle çok teşekkür ediyorum. Çok güzel bir sunumdu. E, mentorlarla çalışmak üstün zekalı Thank çocuklar you. için çok kıymetli ve çok önemli. Fakat tabii bunun uygulamasında yani özellikle ülkemiz açısından düşündüğümüzde biraz şu anlamda sıkıntı yaşıyoruz. Mentor bulmak. Yani gerçekten hmm. gönüllü mentor bulmak hmm. noktasında sıkıntı yaşanabiliyor. Bu anlamda sizin mentorları ikna etme noktasında 
nasıl uygulamalarınız var ve bununla birlikte tabii mentor, her uzman, her akademisyen mentor olabilecek diye bir de bir e, durum olmayabiliyor. Bunların seçiminde ne tarz kriterler göz önünde bulunduruluyor? Bunlarla ilgili bundan da bahsederseniz çok mutlu olurum. <gülüyor> so Actually, we don't have any criteria to choose the mentors because if they are willing to be mentors for free for one year, they are normally very engaged and very motivated. What we do, we have training programs for the mentors. So, and that's maybe I don't know if it uh, would be the same in your country, but I think it's very special. It's persons who have a career in STEM who volunteer for free to do mentoring for one year every week for at least half an hour or an hour. And they also participate during the weekends in our training programs. And uh, of course, uh, that's voluntary as well. But uh, about one quarter of our mentors volunteer to come to our training programs uh, three days in the beginning of the mentoring years. Uh, and half a year after the beginning of the mentoring year. And we also do research and look at how successful the mentors are. And it's actually most of them are successful, but the ones who are doing the training programs are a little bit more successful. So to be honest, we just can't be picky. We are happy <laughs> if they're doing the mentoring anyway. But we are aware the trained mentors are even better than the normal mentors. Sayın Profesör Doktor Haydrunç'ta göre teşekkür ederiz. Teşekkür ederim.